becomes important is that when you have juvenile uh, incarcerates that, that, are, that are under federal guidelines as well that have federal monies attached to them, then the state's in a, in a double com compromised position of not just, uh, not just having justice delayed, but also losing some of the money that that's, could be coming from the feds as well. Thank you. So we've seen, we understand the state's in dire straits fiscally, um, but we've seen the devastating impacts that our communities are increasingly experiencing. We understand the Senate majority is talking about more heavy-handed cuts, undesignated. We feel real concern, and I think all Alaskans should. It's easy to say the budget needs to be cut, and there's nobody who would disagree in that in principle. But we've come to the point where we can see the real, very real consequences, the life and death consequences that those cuts are having, thoughtless cuts, too broad cuts. 7,000 crimes not prosecuted since 2013 because of lack of the manpower to do it. So we have our letter to the governor. We're urging him to res restore positions so that our right and the right of all Alaskans, constitutional right to be protected, to be safe in our state, on our streets and in our homes is upheld. We believe the way to address the fiscal plan includes defining for ourselves, for all Alaskans, what kind of state do we want to live in? How many troopers and village public safety officers are enough to keep our citizens safe? How many prosecutors does it take to have action on behalf of the victims of crime to protect people? How many social workers, how many healthcare workers does it take to have, a to have the communities that we want? When the end game is simply cutting, we do great damage to the quality of the lives of every, every citizen in Alaska. And with that, we'll take questions. Becky Bohr with the Associated Press. Um, I guess uh, two things. One, um, why send the letter to the governor when the budget is effectively in the hands of the House and Senate right now versus going to uh, working through the subcommittee process? And then, um, Second, um, you mentioned the concern about the prosecutor positions. Overall, though, um, at the, looking at public safety, what are the recommendations? Is it um, every other, uh, other, these other areas hold them where they are? Do you want to see additions in specific places? What, I guess, are your specific recommendations for those other areas of public safety? Thank you. I'm going to give that question to Senator Wilkowski. He's our judiciary member. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we do plan on also, of course, sending this to the finance co-chairs and working with them. But, you know, this is, um, these were, a lot of these cuts were cuts that were proposed by the governor's office. And so, uh, I, I, you know, that's step, that's step one. Uh, there, the governor has certainly made an effort to, to trim his budget and, and find cuts where he, he could find. and. Unfortunately, I think he went a little bit too far here. And so it really, it, it, it will require leadership from his office to, to make these happen. Uh, anytime you try to add things back into the budget, it, it's tough. And so we're sort of putting them, you know, we, we want to let him know that, hey, it, if you can reshuffle things so that you can put more of a focus on prosecuting uh, criminals, we think that should be a top priority. If you need more funds to do that, uh, then uh, we stand ready to assist in that effort. But but it was uh, a lot of these were s stemmed from uh, cuts that uh, were proposed by his office, quite frankly. And, and then the follow up, just are there areas other than that that you're looking at for? Um, I mean, are you proposing for troopers or VPSOs to hold the line? Are you wanting to see additions? What for those other aspects of public safety that were mentioned? Well, well right. I, Go ahead. I couldn't, and then I'll probably turn it over to other people. But you know, right now, the, the, the this was just pretty shocking to me, to me, and I think many people that that I've told this to that that testimony from last week that there were seven thousand crimes that were not prosecuted, and I think that shows, yeah, we've we've need to do something about the number of prosecutors and staffing there. I I talked to uh, one of the head prosecutors after the committee hearing, and he said the prosecutors right now are running. Uh, double the, the caseload of the national average. And so they're just completely swamped. They just uh, can't handle any more cases. And so I know they're, they're really pushed to the max. So you need more prosecutors, but it, it, and you certainly, 
I think it's important to look at the, the troopers. We've heard from Senator Olson about the cuts to the VPSOs. I think it's, it's going to be important to look at that. All the, the, you need to take a holistic look at our judiciary system and the criminal justice system, I think. Uh, Senate Bill 91, one of, it's, it's, a, it's a reform and reinvestment law. And I think it's going to be critical that the reinvestment funds go to treatment, go to mental health treatment, go to drug and alcohol abuse treatment. But absolutely, as we dig into this issue and try to figure out what exactly hap is happening in the state uh, in terms of crime, because I think everyone agrees there's, there's been a pretty dramatic increase. People are seeing it on a daily level certainly in my community. Uh, yeah, if we need more state troopers, absolutely. This, this is going to be a top priority for, for me uh, as I go forward. And, and if we need more troopers, absolutely. If I hear from the Department of Law and Department of Public Safety that what we're doing is not working, the numbers we have, absolutely I'll support more for that. And, and I'll just add real quickly before I turn it over to Senator Begich. We heard yesterday from the court system and the Supreme Court Justice that they have made cuts and take and also done some um, real efficiencies, and they believe that they're operating relatively smoothly, but that people should expect longer wait times for their day in court. Um, we recognize that when we have the public safety officers that we need and when we have the prosecutor um, resources that are necessary to follow up on the good work of public safety, that there will be impacts on the courts and down the road we may have to re reassess how we're doing that. Um, so we recognize that, but it is a prime responsibility of state government. Senator Begich. I, I wanted to, you know, draw you back, Becky, to the broader picture here, too. You know, what this underscores first is that when people are talking about further cuts to state government, this is one example of how each time we go down that road, we make Alaska less safe and less the place I think people really want it to be. And I think that is, is a fundamental piece of this argument here. When we talk about uh, whether, where we do the, you know, where we recommend increases, whether it's uh, ensuring that we have a state trooper uh, force that is adequately serving Alaskans, it really is incumbent upon us to stop cutting that force and to ensure that if we need to add to that force, we do so. And that defines how we look at the budget as a whole. That's why when, when we have these sort of uh, knee-jerk approaches to cut the budget, cut the budget, cut the budget, without the realization of the impact of cut the budget, cut the budget, cut the budget, it's our job to both educate all Alaskans to what the impacts of those cuts are at one level, and then secondarily, get all of us working together to build the state we want to live in. And to me, that's one of the reasons why this public safety focus really does get to the core of what it is when we have this budget, broader budget discussion that we're talking about. You heard us a couple weeks ago talk about uh, the stage gates approach, targeted cuts, the oil and gas uh, uh, tax and credit reform, looking at broad-based taxes, eventual use of uh, permanent fund uh, uh, earnings to some degree. All of that's built around and predicated on a belief that we should imagine the state we should be living in, and that's the state we should build for, invest in, and pay for. And I think that that's crucial to the understanding of this particular argument and understanding that when we say targeted cuts have come uh, by the majorities to public safety, this is the impact it's having on you as real people that the, the people need to understand where that connection comes from. I'll add two more quick points. Uh, Chief Justice Starr yesterday also said we're at the edge. We're doing well, but if we go any further, we're, it, it could have dramatic impact on our system. And the second thing is even in an article most recently in the Daily News, it was an opinion piece from a guy who worked uh, as, uh, in the Anchorage Prosecutor's Office uh, yesterday, I think it was, or today, that also talked about the impact of these cuts on local law enforcement. Communities who have jails, and there's 14 or 15 of them in the state of Alaska, 45 percent of their local law enforcement goes, according to that article, to paying for those jails. And if the Department of Corrections stops paying for its portion because it's been cut again, then what you end up doing is putting more and more burden on maintaining the jail, not the law enforcement. That is passing the buck. So people should know exactly where the consequences of the actions that this legislature, any legislature takes, are and who they fall upon. They fall upon you, locally, personally. Anybody else have a question? Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Uh, do you have a uh, estimate of the cost of restoring the prosecutor positions, and uh, where, how would you pay for that cost? My estimate is that uh, it would cost around uh, 
if you were to restore all 31 positions, it would probably run in the five to six million dollar range, maybe four to six million dollar range. Uh, where would you pay for that? Um, you know, we've talked about uh, fiscal ideas that we've had in uh, in a, a week or two ago, and and uh, it's a matter of priority. It's a, it's you know, we think there are more cuts, particularly corporate welfare cuts. We think that uh, there need to be changes to the oil tax system, as, or I do anyway. I want to speak for everyone. Uh, you know, if you can't solve your budget situation at that point, then we need to have a talk about broad-based taxes. And, uh, and then finally, if you can't solve it with that approach, then we should look at uh, using some of the excess earnings of the permanent fund, as has been proposed. Uh, thank you, Andy, for your question. I, I would respond that what's the cost of not doing it? And we see that it goes up and down the chain, and it does affect people's real lives when, when we don't have the law enforcement that's necessary in our communities. Any other questions? Well, I, can I take a, yes. just a real quick comment about that too, Andrew? And you know, it's how we reinvest SB 91 could be a portion of how we, you know, how we do that. We want to invest the savings from SB 91 in treatment and prevention, but it's potentially possible we could invest it in this. I, I, I I'm going to bring up a specific project if that's okay with my colleagues. I, I, you know, we have a the UMed Road is proposed on the edge of my district. I don't think we need it. That's. Uh, you know, somewhere between 15 and 18 million dollars right there. But, but the bottom line goes back to what Senator Gardner said, which is, you know, if we're going to do what, if we determine that basic service is public safety and we're constitutionally obligated to do that, then we have to pay for it. And Senator Wilikowski has walked us through a process that can, you know, each stage of that process you can determine, do we need to do more? And if so, then we need to do more. Senator Olson. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Gardner, I, I'm glad he asked the question because this is where our real problem is. We've got a fiscal crisis on our hands, and I don't see a whole lot being done by uh, the colleagues that I have as far as getting it done. All they want to do is cut. I think we've got to stop looking at cuts because we see the negative consequences on that. I mean, let's, take, let's put faces on these things. A couple years ago, I got a ride when it was real stormy up there in Barrow. The guy who gave me a ride was the assistant DA. A couple months later, he gets shot and killed. The trial's still going on, things are still happening there. This year, I was working up there at Search and Rescue and there was a coordinator I saw every day. Worked with him, dealt with him, flew him around, uh, he gets shot. So these things are people that are, I knew very well, knew, worked with, and gave, you know, gave me a ride like the assistant, uh, this DA did. So as we look at those cuts that are there and the negative things that are happening, with the increase in crime, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everybody here has had a meal there at Denny's Restaurant there in Anchorage on Northern Lights. I mean, when it comes that close to home, it starts to make you think about it. But what I want to say is that we've got this fiscal crisis. We need to start looking at revenues that are out there, ways to go ahead and generate it. We can't cut anymore because we start, we're starting to feel the pinch of it. The revenues, there needs to be a serious discussion on how we're going to increase the revenues, whether it's a state income tax as proposed by the governor last year or by the uh, body, other body that's there, or it's something that comes from the Senate. Uh, it's time to take this bull by the horns and wrestle it to the ground because otherwise we're going to be the bloody mess in the, ba in the, in the end. <laughs> as a great closing comment, we're at our time. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>